Hello there! If you're watching this video, this episode was recorded live during the week of April 22nd, 2018. Enjoy! This is Trisha Lynn, and it is way too early for streaming here on the Geeking Out About channel. Today we're going to be tootling around Taldor, just as usual, but hopefully we'll be able to get out of here and on to the next session called The Spires of Arak. And in the meantime, we have a lot of things to discuss today. Um, so many things have happened this week, and I'm really excited to uh, tell you all about them. So let's just get started. All right. So um, first on my list of things to discuss about is something that I should have done a while ago, and I really regret that I didn't to do it to then. But had I, I was gonna do this in written form, but I didn't feel like it. Why did I turn my spotlight on? Um, okay, sure. No, let's do that. Mm. No, let's just turn that off. Okay, so, um, one thing that I should have done a while ago is talk to you about something that I thought was interesting and fun that I did. Um, and that was to see two Gilbert and Sullivan productions uh, this season. Normally we only do one. Oh no, it's... Oh no, they took the city! No. Yes, let's... Okay. Alright. Sorry. You bring news? Wow, okay. Sure. Never back down. And then you have a quest for me. Greetings. Oh no. Huh. Someone told them how to disable it. We will which endure. means that the traitor in the midst. That's very scary and sad. But there's also something over here and well actually that might not be a bad idea for me to deal with this thing because then I can actually talk about the thing I wanted to talk about for a bit. Um, so, basically, there is a uh, healthy Gilbert and Sullivan community of players here in Minneapolis, which is really, really awesome. Um, I first started watching Gilbert and Sullivan operettas when I was in New York City with the Gilbert and Sullivan players, and they are a very respected bunch of... Um, uh, uh, very respected bunch of actors and uh, designers, actors, designers, you know, people who know their stagecraft, who uh, perform Gilbert and Sullivan uh, all year round, uh, but actually considering how it normally is, they like just do one, uh, there's one show per um, main season, and um, they actually also fell into a bit of a controversy at, when they decided to stage uh, the Mikado, which is one of the more currently controversial operettas by Gilbert Sullivan. And, oh, here's the registry. Why do we need a town registry? I should probably read that. Hastily written, no. Oh no. No. That's so, that's so sad. Hi. Depraved Hunter. I know I have a target. How can I torch? Do I have the torch? I got a power cell. I don't have a torch. Oh, here's a tear stand letter. Hmm. Oh. Oh. Oh my god. Wow. What a dick. 
if that's the reason, well, but at the same time, if that's the reason why she decided to, uh, um, betray the people, then that is also not cool. But it is a reasonable reason why one would want to betray, uh, their country. And their, but maybe not kill everybody else. Like, she would have, she should have had, she should have known that this is what would happen. So, like, it's a reasonable reason for what to betray. It, it's something that's understandable, but not wise, which is, I guess, maybe another reason why. Oh. Another reason why, uh, this person was not a good apprentice? Maybe? Don't know how I feel about that yet. Hopefully we'll get to learn more about uh, her story. And find out more about why she did what she did. Which I am very interested in finding out. So, Torch. Torch? Torch. Yay! Now I can burn piles of bodies. As a... And now I can burn that one other one. And more. Yeah. So, with the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan players, in New York City, I was expect- I, I had grown to expect a certain amount of, um, sophistication in their productions, and when we moved to Minneapolis, I wasn't sure if I would find the same. And of course, you know, my husband- my husband is actually more of the Gilbert and Sullivan fan than I am, um, being an attorney and all, um, which I'll explain later, the whole attorney bit. Um, and, uh, well, no, I, I don't need to explain that. I don't need to explain why his attorney, but I will need to explain why attorneys and Gilbert and Sullivan is a thing. So, um, infinite power of legion, I think that. No, you're not getting my soul. It's staying inside my body right where it's supposed to be. Thank you. Oh, but so many things. So many things want to get some. Yeah, you too. You too, buddy. Alright. Um, and so we started going to the productions here starting in 2013. <sighs> Good. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Prayer book is up here. Where is it inside here? It's inside here. Is it? Yes. Oh, no. That's not the prayer book. That's the leaf shadow. What is a leaf shadow? Oh. A leaf shadow? Shrouds the cities of outsiders. Alright then. And let's just stealth over. Because it is a short distance. Um. So. Gilbert and Sullivan was a thing in our courtship and it became a thing when we moved here to Minneapolis. Yay, Briar Brook. Find a rest one. Let us do that. And so, um, we've been coming to, we've been going to see the productions from the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan Very Light Opera Company for quite some time. 
and they've all been very good, and it's always a lot of fun. Corpse? Well, yes. What? Oh, that's not fun. Don't take away my weapon. I can't show you without my weapon. I need a target. So receive my gift, Morbor. You will be the first of a new breed of conquerors. I don't know how I feel about that. Oh good, you're still alive. Sure. I can do that. Hello. Nice to meet you. Fell orcs. Later on in Asian expansion, we'll get to see fell robots. Oh ow. That's not fun. Yeah. No. Why would you need the bodies? What do you want to do with the bodies? Are you Come, dead yet? Speak with me. Yes, I have it. Yep. Yep. It's okay. Manu cool. Ikta, my friend. Okay. Sure. So you're well enough to retreat. Okay, got it. That's understandable. I would want to retreat as well. After having had my butt handed to me. I will go this way. It is it seems like it is a more direct route. Um, so Gilbert and Sullivan very let off of company. Very good at what they do. I've enjoyed very many of their productions, um, particularly um, their staging of Trial by Jury, which is at the 2015 Minnesota Fringe Festival. That one was really fun, and one of the things I like about the productions is that they usually set them with a bit of um, change to the uh, setting in order to make it feel more understandable for... Leaf Shadow has hidden our position from Terran Gore, and okay. his forces have not yet left Gorok for their final march on Akendun. We have the element of surprise on our side. They are far too powerful to attack head on. Restalon is most familiar with this area. I believe he has a plan. Mm -hmm. So we've got Blood Alps training and the Draenei training. Yeah, you're Draenei. They're getting ready. Here's some mechs, whom they call golems, and a flight path, which I'm just gonna go over here really quickly and get. Hello. You bring news? Nope. Just checking in. Oh wait, but I need to do these turn-ins first, don't I? Yes, I do. Well, let's go back and do that. Uh, I don't know what you just said, um, but I'm going to go into to assume that was, uh, uh, important. So, so basically, uh, trial by jury that they did at the Minnesota Fringe was awesome. And that was in 2015. And then, um, they recently did a production of Princess Ida, which was also great. Um, and that's what I want to talk with you today in a new segment that I'm calling, that I have called Two X's Enter, and where X is a uh, name of a type of media, and the idea is that I will talk about two forms of media, either by the same author, or different authors, or something 
where they have a theme, where they share ideas, where, um, you know, basically the idea is that we, when I compare these two things together, there's a hope that we'll be able to determine not just which one is better, which is definitely one of the goals, but also to determine how things can share ideas in common with each other, but also contrast as well. Um, but let's go ahead and do these turn-ins first. Never back down. Yep. Oh, is there anything else that I could read here? I got that. Anything to read? Nothing else to read. Okay. Yep. Tomorrow Registry. Prairie Rook. And Leaf Shadow. Which is actually going to go forward. Mano Ekta, my friend. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know. Anyways, so, now we go forward. Again. <clears throat> and, so, Princess, uh, and again, but before I continue, I'd like to give a hat tip to Lauren Oster, who is an author and writer and journalist from whom I am borrowing this idea. Um, she would, uh, in her blog, and also in her social media amongst her friends, she would often do something called bringing two books to the Thunder Tome. And I am very sad that I don't get to take that name because that's an awesome name for a book column idea. Um, but again, I also wanted to be able to talk about more than just books, hence two X's enter. Um, so here we go. So let's do Girl, this. Speak with me. Okay. Well, I'd like to, but you're speaking in Vrnai, which I can't understand. Okay. In Edge. For more. Seek the aid of the dead. You endure. Sure. I think I can do that. Um. What's the geography of this like? So here's Akundun. Which in the future is not gonna look as pretty. We are here. Shatra City is here. That makes sense. Like, I'm just picturing this with the Outland map overlay. Like, for example, here is Akundun. And then. Here is also Akandun, which is very sad. Um, we keep, every time I go questing in here, I keep looking for these kinds of similarities and differences. Like, for example, the next area in Draenor there's, like, this is Talador. This is Shadowoon Valley, which is what I le I learned that this is the Alliance starting area. And then down here are the Spires of Arak. But they aren't here. Which makes sense because that's why and how the Arakoa came up into this area. Because their part was sheared off in the... <laughs> oh, I'm learning so much about this game. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, so, oh, I'm in the ruins now. Oh, wait, can I? Can I? Can I? No, it's undead. I wanted an undead pony! I wanted an undead doggy. It's not fair. I already have a fire doggy somewhere. I think I have a fire dog somewhere. If not on this character, then somewhere else, but yes. I 
wanted an undead fire doggy. Anyways, um, so Princess Ida, by the uh, performed as performed by the Gilbert and Sullivan Very Light Opera players, was very cool. And one of the things I always do is they make sure that there's a uh, they don't do the same production the same way twice, which given the limited repertoire of Gilbert and Sullivan. And the number of plays—I mean, there are a lot of plays that they that Gilbert and Sullivan wrote together. But at the same time, there is not a lot of uh, variety in what the um, there's not too much variety in what the plays are and what they do. And so, therefore, every time they do put on a new production, they do something a little bit different to it, which I think is great. And for this production of Princess Ida, what they did is they decided to make the setting, um, steampunk in nature. And, um, which was really funny when, because my mother-in-law had to be, ex had, had to have steampunk explained to her, um, <laughs> and she, w she wasn't entirely clear about the concept. But after telling her, you know, what it's all about, she understood why there were so many freaking gears all over the place and why it was Victorian in outlook and yet things felt very, uh, uh, science fiction-y. Like, the weapons all looked like fantastic gray guns, even though the dress looked Victorian. Like, I'm reminded of that, uh, questionable content uh, strip where uh, Marigold's father comes over to ask her to explain steampunk and he's really mad about it. Um, he's mad he's either mad that it's a thing or mad that he doesn't understand the thing. Which I think is something that happens to all older people who just don't understand a thing that their children enjoy. Um, which is also very sad. Ritual! Hi, now I'm talking to spirits. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool! I did a thing! Hi! What? Do it again? Wait, just not powerful enough? I am free. Was I supposed to do that? I am in your debt, little one. Mm -hmm. You have saved my people from an eternity of suffering. Yay! Help you defeat your enemies. We will repay our debt. I wish I could have heard the rest of what you're gonna say. Anyways, um, so this production was a steampunk affair, and the other thing about uh. Ooh. The uh, did I? Fascinating. Leaf Shadow has hidden our position from Terran Gore. And his okay. forces have not yet left Gorok for their oh. final march on Arkendu. Yes, I, I already did that. Greetings. Hello. Yes. Yes, I was. Restaman is most familiar with this. Okay. Take the battle to the doorstep. And now Glory to the Sindori. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Killing. Uh, too funny. Okay. Cool. Kill demons. Farewell. I would fall then... my own soul to protect my people. Sure. There is no turning back. Okay, um, let's start here. 
because this is going to be easy for me, easy, well, all this is pretty easy. <clears throat> but this is going to be nice and mindless while I uh, um, try to finish my thoughts on uh... Hi! Yes, fight your compatriots. That's a lot of ogres. Dog, did you get do the dogs count? I don't think they do. Oh, they do. Okay. Three. Three ogres. Ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. Hi, come get some. But I will soon. Um. So steampunk, and so another thing you want that that you that one needs to know about Princess Ida is that it is a satire on feminism and uh, Darwinism and uh, other things that I can't think of right now. Um, and so a lot of the attitudes of the show were a little bit dated, which meant that they also had to do maybe perhaps some updating of the text, which to most people who enjoyed Gilbert and Sullivan is a no-no. Um, one of the key uh, things about Gilbert and Sullivan that's enjoyable for many people was that the language is so dense, but also fluid and it's like listening to Shakespeare as if it were sung which for many people is awesome and other people would find intolerable um, but if you're the kind of person who likes wordy songs that are intelligent and music that is uh, ear very catchy to the ear some of the time and um, the kind of situations that don't make for tragic opera, but very, again, it's the, the very light opera company. It's, it's a form of opera that I enjoy. Like, not that I have not enjoyed other operas, I, because I have. Um, but Gilbert Sullivan is, is, I think, more accessible to someone who's just learning to appreciate the format and the form for the first time. But of course, being Gilbert and Sullivan, oh, hello. Of course, being Gilbert and Sullivan, you need to update things from Tiny Diamond. So this version of Princess Ida deals particularly with a plot that is a little hard to understand. Okay. Okay. Cool. So this is definitely going to help the ambush. I'm totally okay with that. Um. And, uh. So the plot about the plot of Princess Ida, the part that makes it hard for a contemporary audience to enjoy is that, first of all, the notion of arranged marriages and the fact that she would have to abide by the contract, uh, by the strict contract of an arranged marriage. It's not cool. Making fun of women who want to learn. Also very not cool. Um... Just the notion of satirizing women in general, very not cool. And so there was a lot of things that they had to do in order to make it 
easier for a modern audience to cheer for the heroes and boo the villains like they are supposed to do in order to be able to enjoy this. And so one of the changes they made was to um, go back to the original uh, poem which the which Princess Ida was based on and to take some lines from it and borrow the intent of the poem in reuniting or uniting the two romantic leads who had not seen each other since infancy and yet uh, one of them states that they are willing to go on with the arranged marriage due to duty, which is again a very common theme in uh, Gilbert and Sullivan works, because England. Um, and so, like, this was very much a thing for people to be always constantly constantly cognizant of their duty um, as citizens of the realm, as uh, English men and women, mostly men. Um, so in order for this production to have a happy ever after, it means that a woman needs, a woman is, a woman is going to be wed to someone against her will someone whom she's never met as an adult or even as a teenager. In fact, the two leads had not even seen each other since they were two. And yet one of them says that they are in love with her. You know, I guess, I don't know if it's a love at first sight sort of thing or just a love of convenience sort of thing or a I'm in love with you, and if I don't marry you, our countries are going to go to war sort of thing. Um, like, that is not... <sighs> Which, by the way, is a very, very common thing in English history. Um, I guess I understand why it's it was important for Gilbert and Sullivan to talk to remark upon it in their works, because so many monarchs in British history have been forced to marry people that they didn't want to marry or just marry for the good of the realm as opposed for as opposed to for love or convenience or affection or um you know affection even anyways so that's something that Gilbert and Sullivan do a lot in their productions satirize things that are commonly in the mind's eye of the people that they are playing towards and uh, in order to make money because isn't that what all art should be about making art that is successful enough to, for you to continue to make art um, so there had to be some changes and the biggest change in my opinion is the change to having so part of the plot of Princess Ida is that Prince Hilarion goes in disguise to Princess Ida's women's college which she had founded and apparently when this was in production at the Savoy the idea of there being women's institutions of higher learning was new the fact that women wanted to go and learn and be academics was new and the populace was unsure about it um so there was you know it was a satire on that oh poop silly silly demons you should know better than to get in the middle of a woman and her pontificating about Gilbert and Sullivan So, oh, 
there's a thing up there. There we go. What? No! Who's that? It is someone I have to rescue. Don't worry, brave elf. I'm here to rescue you. Oh, you know, you know what? I keep forgetting that I have. I keep forgetting that I have cannibal eyes, which is a undead racial talent. Yep, I am going to free you from your torment of. What does the ogre afterlife look like? Is there an ogre afterlife? Because I know that, um, well, the trolls believe something different. All right. You look comfortable. Are you actually in distress? Mm -hmm. You don't look like you're in pain, though. If you were more bloodied, I'd understand that you wouldn't that you wouldn't be able to get down and help me. Uh, Salama Shalanore to you too. All right, uh, books. Where am I getting these books from? Up here. <sighs> Shadowborn Dementors. Okay. Alright. Got that's a core band engineer. Nope. There we go. That's one of the ones we want to kill. Hello. <laughs> nice stinger. Yep. Can do that again? Musical stain? No? <laughs> I'm really digging this music. Not sure it needed to be in a. I, I'm not sure it needed to announce itself in such a way. Although it was a very effective way to get our attention. Hello. Just for me. All right, now I get to burn Burks. That's a big fire. How the fire get so big? Well, I guess he is near death. But if I had, if I had Remember some energies, the then I could Our heal you. I could heal you. I 
anyways. So, the change in this production of Princess Ida was to have, uh, was to have, um, the lead characters meet, um, and have a dialogue that reveals how much, how, how there could be an understanding between them. And the other thing that I think is really interesting about this new production is that, so in order to be able to get closer to Princess Ida at the women's only college that she founded, Prince Hilarion and his two friends decide to disguise themselves as uh, women who want to attend the college. And I was actually looking at older cast photos from previous productions of Princess Ida that were not uh, set in a steampunky sort of world. And uh, the way that they disguised themselves in previous productions had them tying like a skirt around their waist to make it look like they were wearing skirts and also to wear like the traditional uh, robes that scholars wear at other uh, colleges whereas in this production they just wear the robes and they don't pretend to wear the skirts which is great because women can wear pants also um okay good i'm happy about that so now we come back here to do the turn-ins, and then we find Naomi. Maybe we should just find Naomi really quick. Let's do that. Alright. And then I suppose it's up this way. Oh, fine. I'm tired of you setting me on fire. Of depravity. Good hippo. friend. So, so there's that. And then at the very end, um, where there's the whole, oh, you, I'm falling in love with you, even though I really met you thing, um, they, they echo the, the phrase again. So, like, which means that in this time where I'll keep the portal open as long as I can. Okay, what is that for? Hi. Have you any news? Okay. Sure. I can do that. I just hope I can get back. I don't like the 
fix this? Why can't I just stop you right now? The master's plans. Oh, great. Come, Terrible. Our contact has provided another entrance to Ockendu. Your beast of souls awaits. Hmm. Oh, we got this with the bag. A new Bellore Delinar. Remember the sun well. Okay. This must be a dungeon. Don't give up, Soulbinders. Okindun must be protected. Mm. Ooh. Yes, please. Okay, now I have a dear follower, and is this a dungeon? Yes. Okay. Go to hold your head high. But is this really a success? Because look, A, look at all these people dead. B, wait, did we get, uh, did we get Akram to I suppose we did. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and yeah, look, that's the entire story of Talador. Slam. Blah blah blah. I want to get inside. It is a quest. Lots of transmog I can get. Wait, how is she a villain now? What? Is it she a 
follower of mine now? No, Saltwater Shulani is a follower. Okay, what? Hang on a second. I'm so confused. Our enemies will fall. Okay. Remember the sun well. I am so confused. Hi. Okay, I think I actually need to take a break because I don't understand this. Um, and of course I can't get to these junctions because I don't have a high enough eye level finder. You know what? Yeah, let's take a break. I need to take a break. Alright, I will see you in a bit. Don't go away. This is Trisha Lynn, and I'm talking to you from the past. Normally, this is where I would run a promo for an upcoming project of mine, or announce the next time I'll be doing a live recording. However, since this is my first episode, I don't have anything like that planned. Instead, here is where I'll invite you to send me feedback about this video. Do I need to speak more slowly? Did you enjoy what I had to say? Do you have any comments of your own? Leave a comment below and one lucky person will win a $5 gift certificate to the fast food restaurant of your choice. Offer is valid until May 31st, 2018. All normal contest rules for the state of Minnesota apply. Hey, I'm back. Um, and something funny happened while I was on break. Um, not gonna go into it too much, but you might notice that I'm wearing a different shirt. Um, that's because we lost some uh, recording. And so we're just gonna do it all again. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's what happens when you're a first-time streamer, or recorder, or when you're starting out with a, progr with a program. So, you know, we'll just carry on as we are meant to go on. So, since uh, I went very far ahead in the uh, area, I think what I'm going to do instead of just... Um, continuing to work on uh, the things that I was working on, I'm going to go ahead and just um, get this character up to level 35, and then I'm going to start my uh, alliance uh, endeavors. Not alliance, my, um, my other endeavors. Though, you know, those other things that I'm endeavoring to do. I'm going to do that instead. So, uh, what we're going to do is just going to do some quests around the Barrens until I am able to get up to a level where I need to be in order to begin questing in uh, Stranglethorn for both of my um, Alliance and uh, Horde characters. So, let's go ahead and start doing that. This is my uh, Troll Druid. A lucky Kuda. And let's just do a couple quests here and there. Um, the backstory here is that uh, we are near Kalimdor. Oh, we are in Kalimdor, near Orgrimmar, and of course the Alliance 
are the bad guys and we're trying to figure things out. And that is, what is that? Are those prairie dogs? They're level three and I have three of those already. Let's just do this as a warm up. I like warming up. I can just catch the prairie dog. <clears throat> okay, so the thing about um, Ooh, increasing undead damage. I like that. So where we were last left off is that we just finished talking about Princess Ida. And Princess Ida was the uh, uh, was the uh, uh, play that I'd seen with the uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan Very Loud Opera Company with uh, actually what kind of yeah, that's a green prairie dog. I like that. Let's see if we get it. Yeah. Nice! Green prairie dog! But only one person got your jacket. Oh no. Um. Let's get this. Uncommon prairie dog. Like that. Um, Cheetah. Hello. There we go. Fun for everyone. Um, so, Princess Ida. Just finished talking about that. Now we're going to talk about the second Gilbert and Sullivan uh, production I've seen recently. And that would be The Pirates of Penzance at Park Square Theatre in St. Paul, Minnesota. So, Park Square is actually a theater company that I had never uh, been to see uh, productions at before. Uh, my husband and I normally go to Broadway shows, or the touring Broadway shows that come by, and uh, lots of them have been at the Orpheum. It's where I saw Fun Home for the first time. It's where I saw, um, let's see, was it Fun Home, and uh, The Book of Mormon, and Wicked. Basically, every touring company that's ever come through Minneapolis. I've probably seen most of them. Not all of them though, because my husband does like Broadway, but to a certain point. He's not going to see every production. And sometimes he will uh, he will go ahead and um, he'll go ahead and uh, decide to see something that I've, that I've recommended. Such as when I went, when we got the tickets to see Fun Home. Um, side note, if you're ever in a theater, any theater of any kind, and you have a bad listening experience, or you have a bad theater experience, it will behoove you to... It will behoove you to... Um, complain, not complain, but it'll behoove you to, to give a gentle word, genteel word, to the uh, management, to let them know what your experience was. Um, most theater management always want, most theater management wants to know where they're doing right and where they're doing wrong. And when we went to see, I want to say it was Book of Mormon, when we went to see the Book of Mormon, we did not have a good listening experience. We were in the upper seats, which was what we could afford. But even people who are in the upper seats deserve to have a good quality theater experience where we were at, like we were in the very upper balcony, and the sound mix was really loud, and like, I'll say, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I sometimes have a problem with hearing lyrics when they're sung, either on the radio or on an album, and if it's on an album then you've really got problems because that's what 
you know, the, a, a, a studio recording is supposed to prevent that kind of problem, you know? And so, um, you know, we didn't have a great time. I, it was hard to hear the lyrics. Um, it was, uh, it was kind of hard to understand what the songs were, you know, and just for someone who's seeing a show like that for the very first time, you want to know what they're singing. <laughs> you want to know what they're singing. You want to know what the plot is. And I couldn't do that with that production. And so, you know, on the recommendation of someone I, I knew who um, works with the theater companies, uh, she said, do you, you know, write the theater manager and let them know. And I did. And as a result, they apologized for um, my inconvenience. And, um, you know, they wanted to let us know that that wasn't how they typically want their theater goers to experience their productions. And so, in compensation for not having a good time, they gave us free tickets to the affirmation of our choice. And what we decided to see was Fun Home, and it was amazing. It was a great production. Like, I'd given my husband a choice of all the productions we could have seen. And out of all of them, he's all, I guess this is okay. And I heard so many good things about it. And so most of it through Lim and Wal Miranda and his constant championing of the the children in the original Broadway um, Fun Home cast. And um, so we saw it. Turn production was fantastic. We had a great time. I actually ended up buying the book uh, that. Uh, I ended up buying the book that inspired Fun Home. And it was, again, one of the best theater experiences I had in my life. So when I suggested, when I saw the notice about the Pirates of Penzance and their, uh, the Park Square Theater production of the Pirates of Penzance and how it was more in keeping with, oh, hey, I kill how it was a, an adaptation that was a little different from how Pirates is normally produced. And, you know, it was unusual in the fact that um, the person playing the modern major general, and we'll go into that character shortly, uh, was, would be played by a woman. I thought it was interesting and uh, showed it to my husband, who then showed it to his mother, who also likes Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, she thought it was interesting, so we said, why not? Let's go see this. And so we went. And the Park Super Theater is a lovely uh, theater um, located in the downtown St. Paul area. Never been to before. Um, seating was fine. Uh, the tickets we got were pretty good. Sound quality was great. Um, everything was great. And the production itself was unusual, and all, but in a good way. Because what they decided to do, and I forget to do the adaptation, I'll have to get more precise information in my uh, show notes, but what they decided to do with this ad adaptation was to do the production as if it were a play within a play. And based on historical fact about the first production in the U.S., or the, the Broadway debut, or just the debut of the Pirates of Penzance in the U.S. So what happened is that when Gilbert and Sullivan were doing their original productions of, I want to say it was Pinafore, um, they mentioned Pinafore, yeah, when they were doing the original production of Pinafore, they had lost a lot of money on productions in the U.S., mostly because they didn't stage the productions in the U.S., and therefore they didn't get ticket revenue from the new productions in U.S. Like, they did not, like, it, using today's terminology, they were not able to uh, get people to properly buy the license because uh, copyright laws were more lax about things like that back then. And therefore, any production who happened to hear about Pinafore and uh, were able to very quickly... Uh, figure out what the, uh, oops, my other threes. Hey, Prairie Dog. Um, and the Keeper. 
and the adder. Okay, so any company who'd ever heard of, even thought of the word uh, pinafore and were able to figure out what the words and lyrics were, um, and I'll bet you they had lots of people who could shorthand things like that. And songs are easy to remember. Anyways, um, anybody who could do that um, and get a company together could put on Pinafore without paying Gilbert and or Sullivan or, you know, anybody else who was in on the production. Hi, Prairie Dog versus Prairie Dog um, could go ahead and uh, put on their own production and get a lot of money and not give any of it back to the creators, which is a terrible thing. So, uh, so in, with the production of the Pirates of Penzance, they decided, you know what, F this. We are going to go ahead and do it ourselves. We're going to go and premiere this in the U.S. We're going to, uh, we're going to premiere this in the U.S. ourselves. And we're going to, you know, take a steamship from, uh, England to the U.S. and we'll put on a world production, Nino Nino Billy Goat, and so that's what they did. And difficulty bonus, nice. So they did that, and they're and they're on their way to uh, the United States. They are a cup just a couple days out of port when they realize, oh hey, uh, where is the score? And Arthur Sullivan had forgotten some of the score back in England, and there was no time to send either a cable or anything. There was no time to go back and get it. And if you've ever flown cross-country and forgotten something at home, you know exactly how I felt. So, and this was, again, this was a big deal for them. This was going to be their thing. This was going to be their way of sticking it to those damn pirates. Ha ha. Oh my god, that's right, I just got that. It was going to be their way of sticking it to the pirates who were uh, stealing their productions. Oh no. Anyways. And, and, uh, there was no way they could have not put on the, the production. So, they said, okay, um, how much of this do we remember? And for, like, a couple more days on the boat, and also maybe a couple days... Um, practice in the uh, theater that they premiered it in. Um, uh, they recreated most of the score from scratch and memory. It's amazing. It's an amazing achievement and accomplishment for a theater production, a, a theater company, and good on them. And anybody who had never heard of this part of Gilbert Sullivan War before, like me. Um, it's an amazing achievement, and it should be highlighted in a production, and so I'm glad that they did. And the other thing they did with this production was to include tidbits about the um, production itself that were unique, such as the fact that um, the original person who plays Frederick, the male lead, um, he was not loved by the press. He, they did not appreciate his his artistry, which is very sad, but <laughs> but the way the actor playing the actor playing the role uh, portrayed that was just a it, it was gentle and sweet and loving, and I and I think he did a great job, and um, and so uh, and the other thing that they mentioned in the adaptation is that um, in addition to Gilbert and Sullivan being the Impresarios, the, the, not the impresarios, but in addition to them being the main creative forces behind a Gilbert and Sullivan production, they also introduced their female collaborator. And I'm using the word collaborator in a creative contribution sense. And, uh, and so I forget her name. But she, the person that, whom they collaborated with was responsible for taking care of the box office. And here, I'll bet you she's the person who uh, brought the, uh, the the pirate versions of Pinafore to their attention. And she's the one who helped keep the company uh, intact 
when the Chi were having their tiffs. I'll bet. I, again, I'm just, I'm spitballing here about those extra things she did. But what she did in this production was to keep everybody on track. Because they needed to be on track. They needed to focus on doing the production. Because if they didn't focus, they wouldn't have production. Oh, you stupid frog. Yeah, no. There you go. Ooh. Let me search them out again. Uh, let's see, who are my other threes? Oh, I'm running out of threes. I don't have any more threes. Yay! Well, there we are then. Let's maybe move up some twos. I hope that these folks will be strong enough for that, and if not, then we'll have to go back to the fours. Anyways, uh, oh, this thing. I love that thing. Hi! You expected to troll, and you got a bear instead. Um, so... So, when they are in the middle of trying to reverse this this, uh, production, uh, she says, you know what, F it, I will take the role of the Major General because nobody else in the production could because there's only three people in this adaptation. And so, uh, hello, Centaurs have plagued the Tauren, Centaurs have become a new threat, you must destroy the leaders, okay, get that. And then you have a thing. Sent here to scout. Start killing centaurs. Yeah, I can do that. Not a problem. I'm actually uniquely qualified to do that sort of thing. So. So she says, F it. I will rehearse the role of the Major General. Because apparently he could- oh, you know what, that's level 4. Let's change this. Let's change it up. Let's do one, two, one. And the monk. And... Maybe one of my favorites. I don't have any fours as favorites. That's gonna have to change. You know what? I do like the Pandaren Mog. There, that's better. <sighs> Another four. Crab? Short crab. Crab. There we go. So that's... Uh, humanoid, critter, critter... No, humanoid, critter, aquatic. Perfect. I love that. I don't have any of you yet. Oh my. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, damage. No. Stampede. Yes. You will stampede. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, there we go. Well, that's strong. Um, let's do. And then. Okay, I can do maybe one more of those. Yeah. 
and then so now I'm going to a little leveled up. And I'm going to put the mouse in its place. Okay. Back to business. So. So she decides to play the Major General. And if you've never heard of the Pirates of Penzance before, you're not missing um, too much. And the thing you need to know about the Major General is that the Major General is... You know what? He's a pompous character. He, and the original purpose of the Major General was to parody or have a commentary on those military folks who know know everything that you did everything they know about everything like they know everything except for actually how to be a military uh, person and I guess that's something that was happening in the British military at the time and uh, I should pay attention to this fight um, that's something that was happening to the British military at the time and it's something that they thought was silly, and so they decided to uh, parody it in this character. And and after like after a while, you forget that the character is supposed to be a dude. Like you completely forget that. You just think, oh, this is a character who does and wants these things. Who think they know everything about how do you uh, go after pirates. And he's not a very good general. He's just not. Um, and... There was the usual, you know, pairing up of people after the fact, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. But it doesn't need to be, like... It's really not that important that, in this production at least, the character be a male. It's not like it's one of the productions where the character is wooing a character of the opposite gender. And even then, given today's... given that um, society as a whole is becoming more tolerant of same-sex gender relationships and the neutral gender or non-gendered or agendered personalities, it actually makes a lot of sense for sometimes the character to, character to be played by someone who is not uh, the same gender as the young female leaves who have soprano voices and embody those kinds of traits in those characters. And so it's not that big of a deal that the Major General was a woman. The only important thing is that she did, is that she would do the job well, and she did. And there's a lot to be said about the purpose and function of alternate interpretations of classic works. When I talked about Princess Ida last time, I talked about how in moving the... In, in choosing to stage this production now, in this, in this different era of feminism than as it was in... 
that when, when Gilbert and Sullivan just first produced Princess Ida, there are a lot of nuances that I don't think Gilbert and Sullivan intended. For example, um, for example, the fact that in our society we had uh, people who were attacking and killing and holding a hostage and raping and doing horrible things to girls who wanted an education in Nigeria. And seeing those, like that image of the, the men in her intended's army coming to attack and destroy her school and her just because she didn't feel like marrying someone she'd never met or someone she'd only met for a couple like a day or two when she was two years old and someone who thought that she was doing more important things than being married um Yes, I have the head. Yay. Other leaders to kill? Sure. Press the assault. Wunderbar. Okay. So. Like, that was striking. Having the Major General perform the Major General song which talked about the inability of the person singing it to be a really truly effective leader. Now that I think about it, I'm not so sure that I grok the interpretation. And for more than just, hey, a woman is singing this part. Mostly because, okay, so in any production of Gilbert and Sullivan, the Patter song, which is the uh, major general song, there's a part where the major general is challenged to sing the song even faster and faster and faster, which she did with a plum. Um, there's also a part where the person singing the role or just the production in general they get to insert a verse that is a commentary on the times and is not original to the production but is something that you know needs to be updated from time to time and so they did and she had written her verse that she'd written her was about how Either her verse or her line. There's a line in the production about how it was a it was a poke at well more like a poke, it was like punch at Donald Trump for um groping women or just being disrespectful to women of his acquaintance. And unusual spores. Yay, OACs. Okay. And then we're going to turn this in. And then we're going to do... I think that by the time we do the turns, we may be ready to go back to Stranglethorn, which I'm very happy about. Oh, so close. And... So close! You know what? Let's uh, do this one. That one's going to be easier to do. And and or maybe we can just kill a couple of things around here and then that should take care of things. Let's do that instead. Um, 
Oh, do we want to try and kill? Let's get some gold. Let's go for it after the Razor Boar. And let's get some gold. There we are. So anyways, and the, the very liberal St. Paul audience really appreciated the, those jabs and those jokes because we, I, I live in a quote blue state. I live in a very democratic state. We are the, we are the Minnesota is the, are, are the people who uh, still believe in Paul Wellstone and his progressive messages. And because of Wellstone's untimely death, um, he wasn't able to fulfill the promises that he embodied. And I think Minnesotans have been looking for someone like him to believe in again. And I think that, you know, I'm not sure how this happened, but again, Minnesota is just a very liberal state. And so, um, the, the jabs at Trump were very much appreciated by, by the, by the, by not just the audience, but also the production and just, you know, the media appreciated it. They covered it, they covered it, um, equanimably, if that's a word. And... And you! You get a thing in the face. Whack. Okay, so let's get out of here first. Oh, can't do that. Uh, ooh, volunteer guard day. What? Interesting. Yep. And gonna need that. And let's do this. It's been a grueling battle, and we are finally ready for the judge's decision. Princess Ida scoring highly for the strength of the adaptation but poorly for elocution problems from the princess herself. The Pirates of Penzance, scoring highly for its diverse cast and casting, but poorly for the lack of follow-through in the second set. And the winner of this two productions enter is... Princess Ida! Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Two X's Enter. You've been watching a video episode of Geekly Speaking About, a project on the Geeking Out About Twitch channel at www.twitch.tv slash geekingoutabout. The game I was playing was the World of Warcraft Warlords of Draenor expansion on the Proudmoor North American server. The music in this episode was Adaptation Jam by Austin's Citer, Dub the Uke by Kara Square, and Now Wouldn't You Like to Rule the Roost by Gilbert and Sullivan. The first two tracks were licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution and or non-commercial license and are hosted at ccmixter.org. The last song was recorded by the Doily Cart Opera Company in 1965. Sound effects were created by Agrobyte and Full Boy Media, hosted at freesounds.org, and licensed under a Creative Commons attribution and or non-commercial license. The software I used to create this episode was Audacity by Audacity Team and Videopad Professional by NCH Software.